Okay, today I'm going to talk a little bit about gases. We introduced gases back when we were talking about the different phases of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, and we defined gases as having an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume, or a variable shape and a variable volume, meaning that the shape can change, the shape of the gas can change, regardless of the um, different container that we put it in. It actually takes the shape of the container that it's in, and the volume can also change, and that's a different thing than what we see with liquids and solids. We say that gases are compressible or expandable because the volume of them will change depending on how much or how little we have in that much space, which is why we can put a lot of gas particles in a tiny tank, like putting oxygen into a tank, for instance, so that people can go underwater and breathe for long periods of time. All right, we can compress that gas down into a small amount of space, and that's a really useful thing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the different characteristics of gases that we can measure and how they're all interconnected. So we're not only gonna talk about gases, we're also gonna start talking about the gas laws. Okay, so there's four major characteristics of gases that we look at, and the first is the volume volume, let's just call it V, and we know that the SI unit for volume is the liter, so we're going to measure our volume in liters or convert it to liters. There's going to be a lot of conversions in these types of problems. We also will pay attention to the temperature of the gas because the temperature of the gas is going to impact um, some of these other variables, right? We said that temperature has this relationship with particles of matter. If you increase the temperature, then you increase the speed and the motion of the particles. And so we're gonna have this, um, this temperature plane and impact on our gas particles as well. The SI unit for temperature, remember, is Kelvin. Although we don't usually have a thermometer that's in Kelvin, we will often measure things in Celsius and then have to convert, which isn't too hard. That's a pretty easy conversion factor, which is nice. And then the other thing that we're going to look at is the number of particles. Of the gas. So how much gas do we have? Let's call that little n. And we're going to measure that in moles. Remember, that's the SI unit for talking about amount of something, how much or how many. Now, the last factor is something that we haven't spent a lot of time with, but is really important for gases, and that's pressure. Now, pressure's SI unit uh, is the Pascal. Which is abbreviated PA, Pascal. And more often than not, you see it measured in kilopascals. Which is KPA. So how many Pascals are in a kilopascal? That's right, it's a thousand. So there's a thousand pascals in a kilopascal. And that is one of the measurements that we'll see pressure in. Now I'm gonna kind of leave this blank here because we can see pressure in a lot of different types of units. So it's gonna depend a little bit about the problem that you're given and there's gonna be mostly the conversion that you see for pressure is gonna be going from one type of unit to another. And we'll get into that later. Now, because we haven't talked about it much, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of what pressure is. If we're defining pressure, pressure is the amount of force that is applied per unit of area. So it's how much force you apply to how small of an area, okay, or how large of an area. And so if we wanted to increase the pressure, then I'd have to either increase the amount of force that I apply, so push harder, or I have to decrease the area that I'm applying that force to, right? So if I have a smaller area that I'm applying the force to, then I increase my pressure, right? Smaller number in the denominator, increase our pressure here. Now when we're thinking about this in terms of gases, if we have a container of gas here, there's my flask, with my stopper, so my gases don't get out there. So here's my flask. And inside here are a bunch of gas particles. If I was looking at them um, out here, then I'd have teeny tiny particles. We said there's a lot of space in between these particles. They're really spread out. They're always moving around. So these gas particles are moving around, colliding into each other, 
right? Colliding into the sides of the walls of the container. And all of these things are gonna impact the pressure, but the thing that impacts the pressure the most for gases is the collision of the particles with the sides of the walls here, okay? So when we're talking about pressure for a gas, then this really comes from this collision of particles with the container walls. So as we're thinking and talking about these different gas laws, these different relationships between the characteristics of gases, then anything that's gonna cause these collision of particles with the container walls to increase, so anything that's gonna increase the rate of these collisions is gonna increase the rate of the pressure. Not that there's a rate of a pressure, but you increase the pressure for that gas. Okay. So, Let's talk a little bit more about units of pressure because you're going to run into a lot of them in this particular chapter and just kind of in problems in general because we as instructors like to give you guys all sorts of problems where you have to do unit conversions, uh, so you're welcome in advance. <laughs> so the first one that you're going to run into is ATM or atmospheres. Not to be confused with automated teller machine, right? You get money from that. Atmospheres are all about pressure. An atmosphere is literally the amount of pressure that is exerted by the atmosphere on Earth. So if we picture Earth and the atmosphere over it, if we're at sea level, then the amount of atmosphere that's over us is exerting some sort of pressure. And that's basically one atmosphere of pressure, right? One atmosphere's worth. If you're at different locations, different altitudes on Earth, let's say you're higher, let's say you're in Colorado or something and you're up at a higher altitude. Now you have less of an atmosphere over you, so your pressure goes down, right? So if you're up in an airplane, for instance, you have less of an atmosphere, then your pressure goes down. That's why they have to pressurize the cabin to make it more comfortable, right? We have to increase the pressure of the cabin to make it more comfortable for the people inside. Now, if we were to go under sea level, so if we go down scuba diving or something, then now we're below sea level, we have more atmosphere above us that increases the pressure, right? So not only do we have the pressure of the water over us, now we have an extra added atmosphere of pressure on top of that. Okay, so that's atmospheres. The other one that you see commonly is millimeters of mercury. Now, that's kind of a weird unit because we talked about force uh, force per area is being pressure, but this is a length, right? Millimeters, and it's millimeters of a liquid metal. So this is kind of comes from an old device called a barometer, which measures pressure and helps to predict different weather patterns. So we notice that when there's changing pressures outside, right, you hear those different changing pressures and weather systems and all this kind of interrelated stuff. So when you have a change in pressure, then we have a change in the weather. And so that kind of is what the barometer is measuring. It has a pool of liquid mercury and a tube, and then the atmospheric pressure. So if we have kind of, here's our mercury, and then it's related to this tube here, and this is kind of open to the air. Then the pressure is pushing down on this mercury right and as it pushes down on the mercury then it goes up the tube and then we can measure along the tube the length of the column of mercury there and that's our barometer right this is a terrible drawing but basically the idea behind millimeters of mercury so that's why we have a, a length there uh, it comes from again barometer Another one that comes from barometers are tors. This is a British unit, tor, so you'll run into that as well. Um, you'll also see bar of pressure. It's another one that's kind of British, coming from the imperial system. In terms of interrelatedness, one atmosphere of pressure is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Uh, sorry, HG. It's kind of a stylized H there, that's okay. So 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equal to 101 kilopascals. So this will help 
when you're doing your conversion factors in your homework problems, etc. Now I said we're going to talk about the interrelatedness of all these units, so I want to start off by talking about Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law comes from one of the first chemists, his name was Robert Boyle. He wrote a book called The Skeptical Chemist, and he was really involved in converting alchemy to chemistry. So he was really the father of modern chemistry in a lot of ways, him and Lavoisier. So they were really pulling chemistry into the modern age. And Boyle studied gases, and he was looking specifically at volume and pressure. So he was looking at how the volume changed if you change the pressure or how the pressure changed when you change the volume, right? So we're messing with these two variables. And if we're looking at these two variables, so we're changing up two of these things, then in order for other things to not impact that, we have to keep a couple constants. So if we're changing volume and pressure, then we must be keeping our temperature and our number of gas particles the same, right? We're not going to change those, we're just going to change these two variables. And they always talk about it like a piston setup. So here's my piston. That's pretty good. Okay, so here's my plunger. I can push down on this plunger and make the volume bigger or smaller here within this. And if I have some gas particles in here, okay, and now I push down on my plunger, right? I'm going to push down on my plunger, and now I have something that looks like this. And my gas particles in here. Then if I look at this relationship here, I decreased the volume, so they're taking up less space. And what do you think that does to the pressure? Now remember that we said before, anything that causes more collisions with the outside edges of the container is going to increase the pressure. So if we decrease the amount of space that these particles can take up, that's going to increase the number of collisions. So you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure. And vice versa, if I was to pull out on this piston and give them more space to move around in, Right? So I increase the volume, then that's going to decrease the number of collisions. So if I increase the volume, that's going to decrease the pressure. Okay, and this is Boyle's Law. So this is the interrelation between volume and pressure. And we call this an inverse relationship. It's inverse because as one variable changes, the other one does the opposite, right? As one variable goes down, the other one goes up. As one goes up, the other one goes down. It's an inverse relationship where we say that the two variables are inversely proportional to each other, okay? Now what this means mathematically speaking is that when you put together your volume and your pressure, if I was to multiply together a volume and a pressure for a system, keeping my number of moles and my temperature constant, then this is always going to give me the same number. Okay, so if I change the volume, that's going to change the pressure, and it's always for that particular container under those particular conditions going to give me the same number, okay, some sort of constant. And if that's true, then that means that whatever it is that I start with, if I start with some volume V1, multiply it by some pressure P1, okay? Then if I change the volume, now I have a new volume V2, that'll give me a new volume P2, and because they both equal the same thing, they both equal a constant, then I can set them equal to each other, okay? So we say then that Boyle's Law can be written as V1 P1 equals V2 P2. And I really enjoy these gas laws because I always feel like they sound like Star Wars robots. So P1, V1, V2, P2. So we can solve problems then that look like this. So if I have 
a container of gas that's 2.2 liters. So let's say that I have nitrogen gas in a 2.2 liter container at a pressure of 1.75 atmospheres. Okay, those are my initial conditions. Now if I decrease the volume of my container, so it's a variable, I'm able to decrease the volume without changing the temperature or the number of moles, then what is my final pressure gonna be? So it looks like I have a container that's 2.2 liters at a given pressure. I'm having the volume, right? So what do you think that's gonna do to the pressure? Okay, so think about it that way. Now the way I like to set these up in terms of problem solving is to list out all the variables that you have. So we have V1 is equal to 2.2 liters, P1 is equal to 1.75 atmospheres, V2 is equal to 1.1 liter, and then P2 is what we're solving for, okay? So this is kind of our setup for this type of problem. And if I put it into my V1, P1 equals V2, P2, so there's Boyle's law. I also like to rearrange my equation first to solve for the variable that I'm looking for. So in order to get P2 by itself, I need to divide both sides by V2. So now I get that P2 is equal to V1 P1 over V2. And when I plug those in, then I get a P2 that is equal to 3.5 atmospheres. Okay. Now this should be what you expected it to be. I halved the volume, so I divided the volume in half, so I should be multiplying my pressure by two, right? That's the interrelatedness between volume and pressure, and that's Boyle's Law. Now there's a few other gas laws that are important as well. So let's talk about Charles' law next. Charles' law comes from a Frenchman by the name of Jacques Charles. And they always talk about Jacques Charles as being a daring balloonist. So he was an adventure, thrill seeker type, and he was looking at the interrelatedness between volume and temperature of gases. So if you change the temperature, what does that do to the volume for a gas? And this should be pretty um, intuitive to what we expect to happen. So if we think about a balloon, for instance, okay? We have a balloon that's tied off. Here's my knot, okay, and inside my balloon are gas particles. Now my gas particles in there, I'm not gonna change the number, so that means that my N is staying the same. Okay, so I'm just looking at volume and temperature. So the other thing that has to stay the same in order for us to just look at these two variables is the pressure. So we're keeping the number of gas particles and the pressure constant. So you can think about it as doing it under atmospheric conditions, for instance. And so if I increase the temperature here, what do you think that's gonna do to the volume? Right, volume is how much space it takes up, right? So if I increase the temperature, is the balloon going to get larger or is it gonna get smaller? And you should say, well, it's gonna get larger, right? It gets a little bit larger. So I increase the temperature, right? I still have the same number of gas particles. And the opposite is also true. If I decrease the temperature, then that decreases the volume. So this is different than what we saw with Boyle's Law. In Boyle's Law, we said that if one variable increases, the other one decreases. But in this case, if one variable increases, the other one also increases. We call this a direct relationship.
or we say that the variables are directly proportional to each other. Now, if they're directly proportional to each other, then that means that when you take the ratio of them, so if I took an initial volume over an initial temperature, and I compared it to a final volume and a final temperature, they would both equal the same thing. So the ratio of the volume to the temperature is always gonna equal some constant. Okay, so if we put this into mathematical terms, if I have an initial volume and an initial temperature and a final volume and a final temperature, again, because they both equal the same thing, I can set them equal to each other. And this is Charles' law. Now, for those of you who have taken calculus, this is probably going to start looking a little bit familiar because what we're really looking at is the change in volume with the change in temperature, so dV over dt if we're thinking about derivatives. And you can do the same type of math on it here, but we can just plug and chug with these normal variables using these expressions and these relationships. So let's look at an example of that. All right, so let's say that we have a helium balloon that's slightly underfilled. So if I go and I fill up my helium balloon, but not all the way so where it's super tight. So we have our helium balloon. Um, and the volume of the gas when it's underfilled is 3.9 liters, okay? And this is at room temperature. Which let's call 24 degrees Celsius, okay? Now if I increase the temperature, so let's say I take a Bunsen burner and put my balloon over it, which is probably a bad idea. But if I increase the temperature to 55 degrees Celsius, then what is the new volume of my gas? Okay. So again, the way that I like to do these types of problems is list out the variables that I have. I'm given V1, I'm given P1, or sorry, not P1, we're not on Boyle's Law anymore. I'm given T1, which is 24 degrees Celsius. I'm given a final temperature, or T2, which is 55 degrees Celsius and then I'm looking for my final volume, okay? Now the problem with this is I'm in degrees Celsius, which makes sense because that's what I would be looking at in my thermometer, but in order to do any of these gas law problems, I always have to convert to Kelvin. So the magic number to convert to Kelvin is my 273.15. And when I add these together, remember with sig figs, then I'm gonna draw I'm gonna to round to the lowest number of decimal places. So I can basically just add this as 273 because it's gonna give me the same thing when I round. So 273 plus my 24 gives me 297 Kelvin. And then when I add my 273 to my 55 degrees, then I get 328 Kelvin. Now Charles' law is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. And just as an aside, if you had this set up the other way, T1 over V1 is equal to T2 over V2, that's totally fine. Um, it'll still work out when you rearrange it. So if I'm solving for V2, then I need to multiply both sides by T2. So I get V1 T2 over T1. And then when I plug in my values here, I have 297 times my, oops, sorry, 3.9 times my 328 divided by my T1, which is 297. Okay, and then when I plug that all in, I end up with 4.3 liters. That's my V2. So I have an increase in my volume, which is what I would expect. I increase the temperature, so I should also be increasing my volume. Okay, and that's Charles' Law. So I'm gonna stop there for now, and if you have any questions, make sure to let me know.